13. It is so important that one reads and studies the book of the Bible in order, in sequence, verse by verse, just as God wrote it, because most of the misunderstanding and misinterpreting of the Word of God is a simple result of isolating verses or passages from their context. In Mark 11, you remember the king made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem and was greeted with shouts of Hosanna by the people of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Judea. Then you recall in chapter number 12 of Mark that the leaders of the nation of Israel, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they conspired together to turn the hearts of the people against the king and to cast him out and began to plot his crucifixion. And when we come to Mark chapter number 13, we can't forget that. Because what happens, prophetic teachers and prophetic writers love to pull prophetic passages out of the Bible and try and force them upon or, or place them upon the church. And then people in the church either get all excited or get all upset and worried on the basis of something that has absolutely nothing to do with them. And when you divorce Mark 13 or Matthew 24 or Luke 21 from the context of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you can argue and debate for weeks on end as to who is, is being addressed in these passages dealing with the tribulation and the great tribulation. But if you leave them in their context, there's no mistaking the, the subject matter at all. Mark 13 follows Mark 12, follows Mark 11, and the question asked at the beginning of Mark 13 has to do with the very temple that was in view in Mark 11, the very temple that was in view in Mark chapter 12, and the disciples are asking the Lord, if you went into the temple in Mark 11 and found it corrupt, and if you departed the temple in Mark chapter 12 and, and shook the dust of that place off your feet, then, Lord, what is going to become of the temple? Now, why would Jesus take a question about the temple at Jerusalem and give an answer that had to do with the church in Florida? He wouldn't. It wouldn't make any sense at all. So, what I'm saying to you is, we must study this chapter in the, in the setting in which God placed it in the book of Mark and understand that the Lord is addressing a very particular set of circumstances. This is the follow-up to the events of Mark 11, the follow-up to the events of Mark chapter 12. Notice Mark 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here! Exclamation mark. They are commenting upon the grandeur of the temple sitting on Mount Zion at Jerusalem. They're not saying one word about the New Testament church, the body of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ washed in the blood. They're talking about a building on a mountain in a city in the Middle East. That's what they're talking about. Verse number two, And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. Now, let's stop there for just a minute. i got a photograph in the back I can show you in one of the church albums back there. But right here is, is the temple mount, uh, or the temple on Mount Zion. Coming down right here, as you make your way down, you come to the brook of Kidron, and then you come up out of the brook of Kidron, and you come back up through uh, Gethsemane, and right up here on the top of the hillside where Gethsemane left, this is the Mount of Olives. When you are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and you look across the Kidron Valley, you are looking directly at the eastern gate of the city. When you are on the top of the Mount of Olives and look across the Kidron Valley, 
you are looking directly at the Temple Mount. If you're sitting off at a distance, you can see all of the, I, I've got all of this right here in one photograph. It's all right there together. Now, as the, as the disciples are leaving the city and heading up through the through the Garden of Gethsemane, they, they're looking back and saying, Lord, look at that temple. Look at those buildings. What a marvelous place you've given us. And they get to the top of the Mount of Olives and sit down and Jesus says, well, take a good look at it now because it won't be there long. It's going to be torn down. Now, why is that? Because that temple was to be the dwelling place of God Almighty. God Almighty just left and went and sat down at the top of the Mount of Olives. And without the Lord in that temple, there is absolutely no reason for it to be there. And what has happened is the Jews have made that temple their pride and joy instead of making God their pride and joy. And the Lord said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, even your temple. If that comes before me, I'll get rid of it. And it did come before him. And he did get rid of it. Verse number four, tell us. The Lord said everything going to be torn down. They said, verse number four, tell us. When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Now let me ask you something. Given those two questions, why would Jesus enter into a discourse on the rapture of the church? Given those two questions, why would the Lord discuss what you ought to be looking out for so you know that Jesus is coming soon? He wouldn't. The chapter has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with the rapture. It has nothing to do with what you're supposed to be watching for so you can be excited about the Lord coming again. I'm excited about the Lord coming again because he said he was coming. He doesn't have to show me a thing. He doesn't have to do a thing. Nothing has to happen in the United Nations or in China or in Russia or in the newspaper for me to be excited about Jesus coming. He said he was coming. That's sufficient. And the reason there aren't any signs given for the rapture of the church is because it could take place at any moment, at any time, with or without a sign. All the Father has to do is turn to the Son and say, go get them, and we're out of here. There's no sign. There's no, no prophetic vision or revelation. Why? 1 Corinthians 1.22. Take a look. Keep your finger here in Mark 13. Come to 1 Corinthians 1.22. Just about every every day, if not every day, certainly every week, I get something in the mail about the latest sign that the rapture is near. That is a contradiction in terms. You're not going to get a sign for the rapture because signs do not and never have had anything to do with the New Testament church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. For the Jews, require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we, that's the church, we preach Christ crucified. That's why we're not wrapped up in the looking for signs business. Number one, we're not Jews, so we're not getting any signs. And number two, we've got a much higher calling and greater responsibility, and that is preaching the crucified Christ to the world. Look, if I preach the gospel, the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you trust the Lord as your Savior, you don't need a sign for the rapture. You're going whether you're looking or not. You're caught up whether you're ready for it or not. I don't preach the gospel, but I preach signs. I get you looking for signs and not the Lord, and you might miss him. Jews require a sign. Now, whatever signs you read about in Mark 13, whatever signs you read about in Matthew 24, Whatever signs you read about in Luke 21, whatever signs you read about in Revelation or in the Old Testament prophets, they are interesting to read and study. But you're wasting your time to look for them because those signs do not pertain to you as the church. And every time somebody in the church says, here we go, we're almost out of here, look at the sign, they end up embarrassed because God didn't give them a sign for the rapture because the rapture is for the church and the church doesn't get signs. Church walks by faith, not by sight. Now, 
Look what Jesus says, verse number 5. Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, let, let's be honest about it. Is there any possible way in the world that a saved, born-again believer, much less a congregation of saved, born-again believers, much less all the saved, born-again believers in the world, are going to be mistaken about some fella in a, in a long robe with a towel on his head saying, I'm the Christ. There's in any way in the world the church is going to be deceived by a man claiming to be Christ. Who could be deceived by a man claiming to be Christ? The Jews who didn't receive the true Christ when he was here. Who believed that Christ is yet to come. Who believe the Messiah is still in the future. Who are looking and anticipating the coming of their Christ. Sure you could fool them. But man, my Christ has already come. He's died. He was buried. He rose again. He's seated on the right hand of God the Father. If you walk up to me on the street and say, Hey, fellow, I'm here. I'm the Christ. Come on out to my secret camp out here. I got some truth for you. He ain't fooling me for five minutes. I know he's not Christ. Now, the warning about false Christs can only pertain to people who don't have the true Christ. That's that Jewish nation. Verse number uh, seven. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. Okay? Don't worry about it. You know, it's, 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 I was telling Tabitha the other day, we were riding in the car and, and you hit a button and here's the national talk show host. Then you hit another button and here's the local talk show host. You hit another button and here's Marlon, uh, the Christian talk show host. You know, what, you know what all those programs are? They are just one unending gripe fest. That's all they are. Today we're going to gripe about taxes. Today we're going to gripe about the Democrats. Today we're going to gripe about uh, the, the weather. Today we're going to gripe about cloud seeding. Today we're going to gripe about abortion. Today It's just a non-stop whine on the part of discontented people who have everything in the world, but it's not enough. I'm telling you, that's all that is. And boy, let a little, little skirmish break out in Iraq, or or let a little, little shooting take place in, in Moldova, and all of a sudden everybody shifts into high gear. Here we go, boys, this is the end. <laughs> I've heard that so many times, man. I couldn't I couldn't possibly, if I tried all day, get excited about a war or a rumor of war. Couldn't possibly. Now What's, look what the Lord says. He says, for such things must needs be. Why? you got sinful people who are bored. You've got, you've got billionaires in seats of world government who have nothing else to do but try and take over something. That's all it is. You know, there's two kids on the playground at PE and they're fighting over the basketball. Well, here's two billionaires uh, sitting around in, in a, an office somewhere fighting over a country or a gold mine or an oil reserve. It's all the same stuff. It's just on a different scale. You have to understand that. The, the, these things don't just happen by accident. Hitler wants the factories. Okay? Stalin wants the bread. The United States wants the gold. South Africa wants the diamonds. Don't you understand? It's all just greed and covetousness and lust on a bigger scale. The bigger you are, the larger the toys you fight over, and the more people get hurt in the fight. But it's all the same thing that happened in kindergarten. If you want to know what wars are about, sign up and keep the nursery. Okay? And bring in one new toy. Okay? Now that's it. That's, that's what it's all about. And so Jesus said in verse number 8, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I'll show you something. God has a spot on earth, Mount Zion, where the temple is going to sit. God has a city on earth. It's Jerusalem. 
God has a region on the earth. It is Judea. God has a nation on the earth. It is the nation of Israel. Now, now watch this, because this will help you. If the earthquake doesn't affect the temple, if the war doesn't affect the temple, if the bloodshed and the rioting doesn't affect the temple, God's not interested in it. As far as prophecy is concerned, it does not count. You know what's in the Bible about Genghis Khan and the Mongolian hordes? Nothing. You know why? Because it didn't affect the temple. You know why, you know why Nebuchadnezzar's in there and, and Babylon? Because it affected the temple. You know why there's nothing in the Bible about the 5,000 wars that have been fought in Africa over the centuries? Because they didn't affect the temple. You know why the Chaldeans are in there? Because they affected the temple. You know why, you know why World War I and World War II and the Korean War and the Vietnam War and Desert Storm and all the rest of that? You know why they amounted to absolutely nothing as far as Bible prophecy is concerned? Because Bible prophecy is about who's going to sit on the throne at Jerusalem and those wars weren't about that. So, the Lord said, you can get excited all you want. If there's 10 million earthquakes next year, and none of them shake that place right there, they don't have anything to do with the second coming. The second coming is to that spot right there. Okay, well, look, let's go on. Verse number 9. Take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to council, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. Ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Now let me ask you something. I realize that saved born again people in the New Testament church have been persecuted and martyred for 2,000 years. In the library back there, I have Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't mean the paperback edition, I mean the whole thing Fox wrote. It's eight volumes running about a thousand pages each. Once you get past, past the first couple of chapters, nobody's being bothered in a synagogue. The church's problem is not the synagogue. The synagogue hadn't been the problem for a long, long, long time. Number two, when the Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter number two, according to the promise of Acts chapter one, and indwelt the believers, why were we indwelt with the Holy Spirit? So we could be witnesses, listen, unto the Lord Jesus Christ, witnesses of his death, burial, and resurrection. Isn't that right? The witnesses in view in Mark 13 are not witnessing on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are witnessing a message of condemnation against their persecutors. That's a whole different ballgame. Look what he says. Look at verse number 9. Ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. You remember when Paul was brought before rulers? You know what he did? He told them how they could be born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What's in view right here is somebody being condemned for their persecution of the Lord's people after the destruction of that temple. Whole different situation. Verse number 10, the gospel must first be published among all nations, and, and that's going on right now. But, when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. For whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now let me ask you something. What do you do when you lay that down alongside study to show yourself approved unto God? Either there's a contradiction in the Bible, or we've got instructions for two different sets of people. God told you and I to study his word, hide his word in our hearts, and preach the word. He told these people, look, whatever I put in your heart, whatever I put in your mouth, you just say it, it'll be the Holy Ghost. And you know what the great error of the charismatic movement is? They are, they are living like an apostolic church before there is a written scripture or after the written scripture has been taken away from mankind instead of living like people who have a Bible in their hands. 
You don't go around saying whatever pops into your mind and saying the Holy Ghost said. Here's what the Holy Ghost said right here. But if you're a Jew in the tribulation who never had his hands on the Bible and don't know the first thing about it, don't worry. When you get a chance to speak, God will tell you what to say. A whole different ballgame. A whole different situation. Now, the Bible says in verse number verse number 12, uh, so you young fellows in the preaching class, and some of you that, that are already preaching, if you don't if you don't think this chapter has a context, next time you get invited to preach somewhere, just go in there and see if the Holy Ghost puts a sermon in your mouth. You'll embarrass yourself to death. You know why? You got a Bible. He he's not doing the work for you. He told you to study that word. He told you to study how to answer it. He told you to search the scriptures. Don't you go in there pretending like you're a Jew doesn't have a Bible. You got one. And you'll, you'll find that out real quick. Um, verse number 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death. And the father the son. And the children shall rise up against their parents. And shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Whoa, uh oh, there's a, there's a troublesome verse. If you just pull that verse out of the Bible and try and make it stand up by itself. Let's let's read the rest of the chapter. In fact, let me let me show you something. Verse number twenty. Look at verse number twenty. Except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. Now, when I find in verse thirteen saved, and then I find in verse number twenty. Saved, I have a connection in the context, in the passage. What is being saved in Mark chapter 13? Flesh, not soul, bodies. Again, look at verse number, verse number, let's see, four, uh, 15. Let him that is on the housetop not go down to the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. Let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. Verse number 18, pray your flight be not in the winter. Look at the end of verse 14. When you see these things happen into the verse, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Why? To save your flesh from death. How will fleeing to the mountains save your soul? It won't save your soul. What's the chapter about? It's about a time of great tribulation when brother is delivering brother unto death and father delivering son to death and son delivering father to death. And the Lord said, when you see these things happen, get out, run, flee, hide, so you can be saved. That is your flesh from death. Well, you take, you take Mark 13, verse 13 out of, out of the chapter and try and stand it up by yourself and you can teach just about anything. Leave it in the chapter. There's only one thing you can teach. Now, let me show you something else. Verse number 20, but for whose sake? The elect. Verse number 22, look at the end of the verse. To seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Verse 27. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Three times the Lord said, these things pertain to the elect. So preacher, isn't that the church? According to Calvin, not according to the Bible. Then why did Calvin think the church was the elect? Because he wasn't a dispensationalist. He thought this was a carryover from the Old Testament. Isaiah, keep your finger here, Isaiah 42. Mark 13 is about the elect. Isaiah chapter 42. You know why people get, get taught false doctrine? Because their teachers won't study the Bible. They take verses out of the Bible and preach them. That's a good way to get in trouble. Isaiah 42 verse 1.
Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Well, then whoever the Lord's elect is, it's not Gentiles. Well, it could be the church, couldn't it? But let's find out. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. We've ruled out the Gentiles. Can we rule out the church? Isaiah 45 and verse number 3. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel, for Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect. I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Who is the elect, according to Isaiah 45, verse 4, the nation of Israel? Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, verse number 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it. Let me ask you something. Is the church's promise Blessing the mountains of Judea? No. No, my promised blessing is a glorified body in the new Jerusalem. The elect get this land right here. You know who that elect is? It's the nation of Israel. Look at verse 22, same chapter, Isaiah 65. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now listen, when Isaiah says four times, the elect is a reference to the nation of Israel and the Hebrew people. And in Mark 13, in a discussion about this mountain and this temple and the city of Jerusalem, the Lord gives an answer pertaining to the elect. How can you make that the church? You can't do it. The, the matters in Mark 13 have to do with the nation of Israel. Okay, come back to the chapter. Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. Look at verse number 30. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Here's the second place the prophetic teachers fall off their bicycles. Is a generation 30 years? Well, we all thought it was. And so Israel became a nation in 1948. Therefore, we're going to have to have a rapture by 1978. Jack Chick doesn't print that tract anymore. You know why? A generation wasn't 30 years and we're still here. Well, but you know, it it took place in 1948, but you know, there were a few things that, that had to get worked out, and so I know the children of Israel were, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, so that whole generation died out, so a generation is 40 years. So now I give you 88 reasons why the Lord will come in 1988. But we're still here. Why? Because a generation's not 40 years. Well, now what have we done? Now we've said, well, you know, I know a man's days will be three, four years and ten. So we can try 70 years. Or we can do the Hal Lindsey thing and say, well, the Jews got Jerusalem in 1967, and that's when the clock started running. So 30 years from 1967 is 1997, and here we go, camping with Harold Camping. But we're still here. Now let me show you why you can't set a date based on the generation of Mark 13 or Matthew 24. Come to Genesis chapter 5. 
Genesis chapter 5. Genesis 5 and verse number 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his likeness. Genesis chapter number oh, 10, verse number 1. Genesis 10, 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. According to the Bible, you know what a generation is? It's a race of people. To generate, to regenerate, a progenitor. A generation is a race of people. As in the generations of Adam, the generations of Shem, the generations of Ham, the generations of Japheth. You know what Mark 13 is about? It's about a time period in which the devil is making an all-out effort to exterminate the Jews. You know what the Lord said? He said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. He said, try as you might, you're not going to kill off the Jews. The generation of Abraham, the generation of Isaac, the generation of Jacob will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. You know why you're always wrong setting a date? Because a generation has nothing to do with a date. It has to do with a race of people. Now again, coming back to Mark 13, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you that the context of these remarks has to do with the children of Israel. Every way you look at it, these things have to do with the Israelite people. Mark chapter 13 and verse number 14. Let's look at it again. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Florida Flee to the mountains. Then let them that be in the United States flee to the mountains. No, I believe it says Judea. This has to do with a certain group of people in a certain place. Now, let's come to Daniel chapter 9 and find out what the people living in Judea are to, are to run from. Daniel chapter 9, and verse 24. Daniel 9, and verse number 24. Seventy weeks. Let's go back. Daniel 9, 1. The first year of Darius, the son of Ahusuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Daniel read in Jeremiah that Jerusalem was to be desolate for 70 years. At the end of that 70 years, God would bring his people back into the land. And in Daniel 9, Daniel begins to pray to the Lord as the fulfillment of that promise. And so the Bible says in Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay? Question. Who were Daniel's people? The Jews, the Hebrews, the nation of Israel. What was Daniel's holy city 
it was Jerusalem. Therefore, whatever you read in Daniel 9, 24 to 27 has nothing to do with Gentiles and it has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with Daniel's people and Daniel's city. Now why am I so emphatic about that? Because, because saved people, saved born again people are looking for anything, it seems, other than Jesus Christ to come and take them out. And, and listen, you can live in anticipation of that every single moment of every single day without a war, without an earthquake, without a disease, without a peace treaty, without an assassination. You ought to just be excited about Jesus coming. And all the argument and debate and churches dividing and denominations dividing and organizations dividing over, over which part and how much of the tribulation has to do with the church, if you just put everything in its context, the church is not even part of the discussion. Watch. Daniel 9.24 Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Number one. The 70 weeks are, number one, to finish the transgression. How many of you are saved? You say, did your Savior say on the cross, it is finished? I don't need a seven year tribulation or a three and a half year tribulation or a one week tribulation to finish off my transgression. Mine's finished. Whoever Daniel 9 has to do with, it's a group of people whose transgression is not yet finished. Mine's finished. It's over and done. Number two. To make an end of sins. The Bible tells me, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, Christ bare our sins in his body on the tree. He made an end of my sin. What about that Jew? He hadn't trusted the Lord yet. What about that Hebrew nation? They haven't repented yet. What about that nation of Israel? They haven't, they have received their Messiah. So their sins aren't finished. My heart. This has nothing to do with me. Number three. To make an end of sin. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Second Corinthians 5, 19 to 21 says, the moment I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, God reconciled me to himself by the offering of Jesus Christ. I don't need a tribulation period or half a tribulation period or a week of a tribulation period to reconcile me to God. I've been reconciled. That Jew, that, that Jew hadn't. That Hebrew nation hasn't. Number four. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, if you're a born-again believer, you have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that righteousness guarantees you everlasting life. Why would I stick around for the first two days of the tribulation when the entire purpose of the tribulation is to accomplish something that's already been accomplished in me? I don't need to be here. The purpose of that, those events is to bring about something that was brought about in my life the moment I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. And I got, I got, there's two more here, but I'll tell you something. Every person, I know there's exceptions, I know you probably know somebody, and I, and I, I, I'm not finding fault with any of you if you don't agree with this. I, I, I mean, I'm not picking on anybody, I don't know what you believe about these things. But I'm going to tell you something. Everybody I've ever heard put in the church in the tribulation is because we deserve a little bit of punishment as carnal and worldly as we are in these days. Yeah, but no matter how carnal and worldly I am, it's all been paid for. It's all been punished. The reconciliation has been made. The transgression has been paid for in full. I don't need an earthly purgatory to make me ready to go to heaven. Jesus made me ready to go to heaven. I, my, my debt is paid. The Bible says in verse 24, 
bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision. There is no vision or prophecy relating to the New Testament church as such. And to anoint the most holy. The church has a savior and a head. The church has no king to anoint. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 1, 1 Peter 2, Revelation 5, every member of the church is a king. When Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, he's got a banner on says, King of Kings. And when he gets here, he destroys all the earthly kings. Well, how can he be the King of Kings if he destroyed all the kings? He didn't. There's a whole army of them riding behind him. They're the born-again believers. He's the King of Kings. But he's our Savior. He's our head. Now, what am I telling you? I'm saying that every reason given in Daniel 9 for the tribulation is something that pertains to Daniel's people and Daniel's city, and it is something that has already been done for every single member of the New Testament church. So he says this, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince should be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Three shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off not for himself and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Okay, so I've got I got three score weeks and two weeks and seven weeks. Three score and two and seven gives me sixty nine weeks, and that leaves me how much? That leaves me one week. There's one week left after Messiah the Prince is cut off. Turn in your Bible to Ezekiel, ah, uh, what chapter? Four, I think. Yeah, Ezekiel four and Numbers chapter fourteen. Ezekiel chapter four and Numbers chapter fourteen. If you've not been with us long and your head is spinning about now, I don't mean exorcist type spinning, I mean just a bit confused. There are a room full of people here that will tell you after the service with a smile on their face, the first time I was bewildered. And the second time through, I saw one or two things, and I, I've heard this now seven or eight times since I've been here, and every time it, the picture gets a little clearer, so don't listen, don't give up, don't give up. We're... I, I'm dumping a year of Bible school on you in about an hour here, but but just get what you can, okay? And don't don't hit the panic button because we go over these things again and again and again, and it, it'll come clear to you. Now watch Ezekiel chapter four and verse number six. When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Each day for a year. Come to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of the days in which ye search the land even forty days, each day for a year, so ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Now, according to the law, Numbers, and according to the prophet Ezekiel, when God is dealing in judgment with the nation of Israel, he operates on a day-year timetable. That's scripture with scripture. That's the Bible with the Bible. Now, that being the case, if God dealing in judgment with the nation of Israel, if there is one week remaining in that type of operation, 
day, year, one week, we have seven years remaining in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. That's, that's where we get our, our seven year tribulation. That's where the whole idea comes from. Okay. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And verse number, oh, I can't read the whole, whole matter. You can tonight. Jeremiah 30 and verse number 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Not mine. Thank God. Thank God it's not mine. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved. He that endures the end of it shall be saved. This generation shall not pass away. He shall be saved out of it. Okay, so we've got seven years for Daniel's people, God's elect, and Jacob. Now, I don't care where you go in your Bible, you cannot put this on the church. Everywhere you look, God goes out of his way to make sure you understand this is about the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Come back to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Now here's what the world's waiting for, folks. They are not waiting for a war in Europe or a war in China. They're not even waiting for a war in the Middle East. I'll tell you what they're waiting for. The Bible said in the days of Noah, there was one thing that held back the flood. Anybody know what it was? First Peter chapter 3. There was one thing held back the flood in the days of Noah. The ark wasn't ready. Noah was ready. Animals were ready. God was ready. The world was ready for judgment. The Bible says in 1 Peter that, that, that Noah preached while the ark was a preparing. Once that ark was ready, down came the flood water. You know what this world is waiting for? They are waiting for the mountain hideout west of Judea to be sufficiently prepared to accommodate the remnant of Israel that's going to flee there during the tribulation. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know what I don't know what has to go on over there. I don't know what God's setting up and what He's doing. All I'm telling you is, that, is look, the thing that has to happen to kick off the tribulation is the preparation of a secret hiding place that you don't know about and don't know where it is and don't know what's going to be there and don't know how to get there. So how could you possibly know when the end is if the thing that triggers the end is a secret? Said the Lord James, don't you think? Now, now, wait a minute. Look at verse 32 of Mark 13. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man Know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. See, I know we can't know the day and the hour, but we can know the times and the seasons. Come back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time? Restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. You ain't gonna know nothing <laughs> about the when. You know why? It's A1 top secret classified. Now I'm glad of that. You know why? 
Because if I can figure out from, from the Bible, now think about this. Suppose you're a Christian in 500 AD. Wouldn't it be discouraging if you figured out from the Bible in 2001 we'd still be hanging around down here? It'd be awful hard for you to get excited about the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior if you could prove from the Word of God it was 1,500 years away. Say, preacher, don't you believe we're in the last days? I sure do. And so did Paul. And so did Peter. And so did James. And so did John. And so did Andrew. And so did Apollo. And I'm telling you, everybody that gets saved and gets filled with the Holy Spirit of God is excited about the Lord's coming and he's sure it's just around the corner because he said in the Bible he was coming and God's not going to take that joy and that hope away from you by telling you when he's coming. Because if you found out tonight it wasn't for another 420 years, it would get you down. But I think he's coming tonight. And if he doesn't come tonight, I'm looking for him tomorrow. And that and that's a strong motivation to me. I said a couple of weeks ago, I was preaching up in uh, North Carolina. The group preaches about a thousand people there. And I told him, I said, man, I, I've seen so many dates for the rapture come and go. And I've seen so many signs of the end come and go. And, I, and I'm, just, I'm just thankful to God that nobody yet has been able to discourage me out of my hope and certainty that Jesus could come today, because if I lose that, I don't know what's going to hold me up. It's sure not going to be anything happening around me. I don't want to know anything. It wouldn't be great to know he's coming tomorrow. I don't know. You promise it wouldn't freak you out? You have a nervous breakdown? <laughs> I think the Lord knew what he was doing. I think he set things up just right. Now look back here, Mark, Mark 13. Mark chapter 13. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm not, listen, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you. These books that, that get you excited about the Lord's coming because of some new event, in, a, in another month or two, you need another book. But if what excites you is just the promise of Jesus that I'm coming again, then you just stay excited. And once you buy one book for 19 bucks, the Bible, or nine bucks in paperback, you don't have to keep buying another one to say, oh boy, he's coming. Look here, he's coming. Hey, look, see, see this Bible? Look here, he's coming. I'm excited. I, I'm ready to go. Saddam or no Saddam. Khomeini or no Khomeini, Gaddafi or no Gaddafi, Ho Chi Minh or no Ho Chi Minh, I'm ready. Fu Manchu and Drop Spoon and all those guys. Mark 13, verse number 14. When you see the abomination of desolation, then let them which be, that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down to the house, neither enter therein, take anything out of his house, and let him that is in the field not turn back again for take up his garment. Woe to them that were child, why it's slow you down. Them that give suck in those days, why it's slow you down, hinder you. Pray you that your flight be not in the winter. Now listen. If this foreknowledge of God predestination thing is as set in stone as you like to believe it is, if this date of a rapture is as ironclad as some people want to make you believe, and how come Jesus said, you better pray this doesn't happen in the wintertime? You know why he said that? Because he's just going to tell you later that even he doesn't know the day or the hour. And so the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, hey man, for all I know this thing's going to be in the winter, you better pray it's not. It'll be a lot harder to get out of the, out of the city and get to those mountains in, in the wintertime than it will be in the good weather. God's not up there bored out of his mind because he knew a million years ago what was going to happen today. I don't believe that. The Bible says in the book of Acts, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. That's God's part. Didn't say he knew everything you were going to do. If he does, I bet he hates to wake up in the morning and see me living another day. Um, first. <laughs> Verse number 19. In those days should be afflictions such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created 
unto this time, neither shall be. Jesus was a creationist. Verse 20, now, now look. Here comes one of those peculiar Knox heresies. That's what they're called anyway. Except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he has chosen, he has shortened the day. Now, here's all I can tell you. And you don't, you don't have to agree with this. Um, but that's all I know to do. Seven years. That's written in the Bible. Three and a half years for the Great Tribulation. That's written in the Bible. 1260 days. That's written in the Bible. 42 months. That's written in the Bible. If all these scriptures written in the Word of God can't be broken, then shorten the days can't mean the Lord says, wait, I changed my mind. It's only three years. Wait, I changed my mind. It's only 40 months. God can't break His Word. All I know to tell you is the God, look, look at the context. Creation, verse 19. Did God speak and there's the sun? Did he speak and there's the moon? Did he speak and there's the stars? Did he stretch out the heavens like a curtain? Didn't God put all those things in motion? Then can't he just wind them up a little tighter and make them all spin a little faster if he wants to? Can't God make the sun rise and set in 22 hours instead of 24? So that we got the same number of days, the same number of months, the same number of years, but it got by a little bit quicker. Now, that doesn't violate the grammar of Mark 13, and it doesn't cause you to have to break some of the, some of the statements God made in the Bible. I'm not saying that's so, but, but, uh, it, it, it makes sense to me. Of course, there's things that make sense to me, don't make sense to anybody else in the world, but that's, that's okay. Verse 21. Then, then, if any man say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or Lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise, shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Take heed, behold, I have foretold you all these things. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven to be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. The Lord said, if you don't see the lights of the sun, moon, and stars go out and see the Lord coming down out of heaven, don't believe anybody who tells you he's Christ. Now, can I put in a good word for a fellow that's, that's taken a, a really hard rap over the years? You know what Jesus said the, the last time he met together and taught his disciples? The last time Jesus taught his disciples, if you read the cross-references of Luke and Matthew, Jesus said, if, if, a, if they tell you they saw Christ in a secret chamber, don't believe it. Is that what, you know what he said? He said, unless you see the sun go out and, and, the, and the moon turn to blood, all, all that, don't believe it. And, and one day Thomas walks in, and, and his buddies say, hey, we saw the Lord. What do you mean we saw Well, we were here in this secret place, you know, hiding out. The Lord came and appeared to us. Thomas said, no, no, you're not fooling me with that. Uh-uh. Jesus told me not to believe you. Now, look, you can say what you want about doubting Thomas, but I, I, I'm telling you something. Thomas had instructions from the Lord not to take anybody's word for it if they say they saw Christ in a secret chamber. And they told us, hey, we saw the Lord. I mean, we were raised right here. He said, I didn't see him. No way. No way. Those weren't the instructions. All right. Verse number, verse number 20, 28. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Who's coming for you? Isn't the Lord himself going to descend with a shout? Whoever this crowd is, angels are coming to gather them up. I'm not getting gathered up. I'm getting caught up. I'm not being gathered by angels. I'm being caught up to meet the Lord. Now, you young fellas, listen, you've got to promise me you'll do something. If God puts you in the ministry, don't, don't get out there and preach everything under the sun as the second coming. 
If it's the rapture, preach the rapture. If it's the second coming, preach the second coming. And don't mix them up. Oh, boy, one of these days, the angels are going to come, and that angel band is going to come down with snowy wings and gather us all up, and, and we're going to be escorted by angels in the presence of the Lord. No, we're not. We're too good for that. We're the bride of Christ. He's not sending a servant to come get us. He's coming himself. He'll send angels to gather his elect people from all over the earth and bring them back into this land right here. But we we got a whole, whole different trip. We're going to take. All right. Verse number, verse number 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When a branch is yet tender and put a forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see all these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. Isn't that great? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed. Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house. Mark 11. My house shall be called of all nations. A house of prayer. You see the context? The Son of Man left the house. Taking a far journey, left his house and gave authority. What was the argument about in Mark chapter 12? Authority over the house. Gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For you know not when the master of the house cometh. Right there. There's the house. You know what those Jews called it? Not the believers. Every believer called him Lord. You know what the Jews called it? Come on, you, you, we've been through 12 chapters of Mark now. They called him master. You know what he said? He said the master of the house is leaving the house. But the master of the house is coming back to the house. He'll be home. It might be at even. It might be at midnight. It might be at cock crowing. It might be in the morning. Lest coming suddenly finds you sleeping. What I say unto you, there's the Jew. I say unto all, I guess that'd be all. Why? Why? Now you know something? Long time ago, I got saved. Girls Holt heard me tell this the other night. Up North Carolina. Bill Morgan's preacher I sat under. And I'm sure I had heard probably 50 times growing up in Sunday school, growing up in church about the rapture and the Lord coming back. But you know, until you get born again, you don't you don't ever really hear anything. The words go by, and you might you might get a fact here and a fact there, but but you, you never really get it. That morning he preached that Jesus could come, and he could come at any minute, and 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 without warning, just trumpet of sound, we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You tell us how that uh, how that church pulled out on the U.S. one had a little uh, Honda Civic. They're almost making them as small again as they used to. I was little Honda cars, and I pulled up the corner of US 1 Wayne Avenue. It was one only, I think, on three traffic lights in town then. And and the light was red, and I stopped, and there's a light. I just stuck my head out the window and started looking. And I looked over out of the corner of my eye, and one of the elders from the church was in the car next to me looked over at me and went, frowned and shook his head. So I got to church that night. I had a lot of meetings with those guys. We had one of our one of our meetings, and and he said, uh, "What were you doing?" 
I said, man, didn't you hear what preacher preached this morning? He said, the Lord could come. He could come at any minute. I said, I just look and I want to see it. He said, let me tell you something. You don't have to do that. And I said, um, I said, listen, I've got a little grace I had none of that. None. And I said, let me tell you something. I wasn't doing it because I had to. I was doing it because I wanted to. You know something, for, for years and years and years and years and years, I've had church people that have settled down this world and gotten comfortable and lost their excitement about the Lord coming trying to tell me I don't have to watch and I don't have to look and I don't have to be ready. And I want to tell you tonight, I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I want to. And I'm telling you, after all these years of church life and church people and preaching the gospel and trying to win people to Jesus Christ, the only hope I've got in this world is that Jesus Christ is coming to get me out of here and you're not talking me out of that hope. You're not going to do it. You say what you want about some of the folks around here. It's too fanatical. They're too loud. They're too quiet. They do, don't do this right. Don't do that right. And I'll tell you, you give me that bunch that's looking for the Lord to come. That's the crowd I want to be a part of. I want to be part of a group of people that is looking for Jesus and expecting Jesus at any minute, because it might be any minute now. It just might be. I, I, I didn't think, I'm King Christian, I didn't think I'd live long enough. I thought Jesus would come before I ever got married. I really did. Girls heard me say this the other night, and I mean it. And I got married. I thought Jesus come before we ever had children. I never dreamed. I never dreamed. I'd be standing here tonight preaching to my son, a high school graduate, and we're still here. I never dreamed that. And for all I know, for all I know, one day your grandkids be preaching down there at the nursing home and they'll come they'll be wheeling me down the hall and say, and they're doing this, they'll be here. So I'll be doing by now. I'm just listen, I'm just telling you, God helping me. God helping me. If I live to be a hundred years old, I will still be looking with excitement for Jesus Christ to come and get me. Now, I'm telling you something. If Mark 13 is about the church, you lose that hope. Because Mark 13 tells you to look for an antichrist, not Jesus Christ. And Mark 13 tells you to look for a way out of town into the mountains, not for a way out of this world into heaven. I don't find any hope in that at all. My hope is Jesus Christ coming back. And Ezra was a boy, a little boy, right in the car seat. Man, he couldn't even talk. Thought he could, but he couldn't. We'd be riding down the highway. I don't know if you've ever seen it. And that the sun will be behind a bank of clouds. And those rays of light are shooting out from behind those clouds. And I'd say, look at there, boy. Watch close. That might be Jesus. I still do that. I still do it. You say, oh, you're nuts. Man, somebody twinkling in an eye. You couldn't see it anyway. How do you know? You tell me what it hurts to be looking. I guarantee you, I got a better chance of living right if I'm looking for Jesus to come than I do if I start looking somewhere else. I believe he's coming. I am not going to look for an antichrist. I'm going to look for Jesus. That's my blessed hope. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We pray, God, that some of it, part of it, has been clear, has been a help to all of us here this evening. Father, may we live in anticipation, joyous anticipation of your coming. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight, they've never trusted you as their Savior, please remind them that if you do come, they'll be left behind to face all of these terrible things are going to happen in the world. Father, I, I pray you'd speak to their heart and urge them to trust Jesus and be born again. Please, Father, 
We pray these things in the precious and holy name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.